us. While you're standing, uh, grab your word real quick. And uh, um, uh, going forward after today, I'm on a mission to try to get everything I, I want to say in a succinct period of time. But uh, I, I'm not going to worry about it after today. I just ain't going to. Y'all are not going to worry me. I, I see some of you already taking your little watches and seeing what, what time, the, what, what lie he going to tell this week. I'm not going to tell any. I'm going to do what thus says the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews 10, 25, and then we're going to go over to the book of Matthews 25, 34 through 40. Hebrews 10, 25. We, you, you should be familiar with it a little bit because last week we preached from that thought. We were preaching uh, why we need the church. And uh, since y'all rushed me, I didn't get it all. And it served as a foundation for this week. Uh, I want to look at uh, Hebrews 10, 25, and then Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. When you have it, say amen. If you don't, just say, wait a minute, hold up. I heard one or two. Look on the screen. Paul is writing, and he's, he's talking to the believers about transition and spiritual growth. And we had talked about that last week, and we were saying why we needed the church. And here was the final thought. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching and what Paul was saying listen you're going to go through some storms in this life but I have given you the solution to every storm it's in the word you're going to be rooted and grounded in the word so don't give up coming to the place where the word is going to be given to you so when the storm comes you don't just stand on your feet you stand in the word amen so he was talking about uh, persevering faith and preserving faith. In, in fact, he was saying you need to establish your faith and then learn how to persevere and preserve that which you held on to. He says hold on to the profession of your faith. And they were being criticized and talked about. If you flip over to Matthew, Jesus begins to build on this and because what Paul was saying, you need to come to church not just for yourself, but for others. So you can encourage others, that you could provoke others to good work. What good works? Standing in the word when the storm comes. What Elder Ford just did, she just encouraged us through somebody's testimony. Won't she tell somebody's testimony? Through somebody else's testimony, but we all got encouraged. And, and, and this woman of God that is given the testimony had to stand on the word when it wasn't working. When, when her, come on, y'all. When your kids aren't doing right. And if you say, man, my kids are perfect, you ain't had them long. You have not had them rascals long. Keep, keep hope. You, you couldn't have had them very long. Jesus began to talk about the principles of the kingdom of God and he's talking to his disciples and he's saying to his disciples, he says, when I come back and I'm sitting on the throne and, and I've got the sheep and the goats that are together, I'm going to take the sheep and put them on my right side and put the goats on my left side and, and then I'm going to give rewards to those who have done what I call them to do. But even here, Jesus is talking about caring for the people in church look at it with me verse 34 through 40 then the king will say to those who are on his right hand come you who were blessed by the father take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world I thank God that God got a blessing with my name on it already since before I came Oh, go ahead and put that back up. Thank you, Tiff. Y'all doing a great job. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Wait a minute. What? Keep that up there. He is saying, I'm going to give you a reward for loving on other people. What? He says, I, I, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your nice beautiful home and didn't wonder and worry about where I was going to sit myself down. You didn't go put plastic over where I was going to sit. 
Now, some of those old school, y'all know y'all put plastic on a brand new couch. You should have bought plastic couches and cut out all that foolishness. He said, when I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, Lord, what? When did we see you hungry and feed you? Lord, when were you thirsty and give you something to drink? Here's the thing here. Some of us are willing to do things for God, but we don't want to do it for man. How can you love a God who you've never seen and hate man who you see every day and not realize that when you love man, you're loving God? Come and put that back up there real quick. I feel a preaching spirit, but I know I'm supposed to teach. He said, when did you see a... He says, when did you see you a, a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? He said, I don't remember. When did you see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? I don't remember. But here's the answer. The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Today I want to talk about the caring church. You may be seated. The caring church. The caring church. And notice I don't have a picture of a man. I don't have a picture of a building. I've got a picture of a person. The caring church. When we started this series, and this series is about back to church, and, and we wanted to do a theme up here that made it looked like we were fishers of men because that's what the Bible calls us to do. And, but we recognize that as we're fishing for men, we're evangelizing men and women and compelling them to come to know Christ because in these last and evil days, many are drifting away from Christ and the church. And, and we find out that many have uh, begun to have such a negative thought of the church that they don't come to church. And many times the people that need the church the most, the church is least accepting of. Come on now. We are always ready to parade those who got uh, pedigree and, and those who got a little something, something. But you show the greatest love when you love the least of these. When a brother or sister can come in here smelling like they just came from the club and you may have seen them there. So don't look down on them. Act like you hadn't seen them. And they'll act like they hadn't seen you. But if you don't know them, just love people where they're at. Stop trying to fix everybody when you can't even fix. Mm, I do feel a preaching spirit. I think it's because Michael was here today. I, I see it. He aimed high. He's in the Air Force. I ain't going to talk about him. Though. I'm going to keep going stay on, stay on point. Stay on point. So we recognize that God is saying something to us. He, he's saying, I want you to understand that I am going to judge you by how you love people and, and, and how you love the least of these. Some folks come to church and you say you love the pastor, but you ain't spoke to your husband all week. You say you love first lady, but you won't speak to your children. Hmm. How do you love the least of these? And last week we talked about the call, we talked about the concern, and we talked about the cost of being the church. Hebrews 10 and uh, 25, it, 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 one version says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves. And we talked last week about the difference between gathering and assembling. We said that the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia which means the assembly of believers and we said that we need to, to understand the power uh, of assembly we talked and I shared with you a puzzle where all the pieces were gathered together and when they were gathered together they had a potential but when they got assembled they had a purpose 
And that what God says is when you come and attend church, you have potential. But it's not, you don't get to the purpose or the power until you get connected. Somebody say get connected. So when we talk to you about getting connected, it's, it's all of the parts being assembled together. And I gave you the example of even my kids. When I bought their bike, it came in parts. And it had no power until it was assembled. God has given you gifts and talent, but they don't do anything until you connect. And God has done something, and he wants us to understand that he says, even in Hebrews, you don't have to go there. Uh, in Hebrews um, uh, 10, around 22 through 24, he was saying, he says, I want to tell you, he says, I want you to not only be the church, but I want you to con be concerned about people in the church. I want you to provoke them to good works and to love. And he says, I want you to get on their nerves until they do what thus says the Lord. Anybody that you know has an anointing, to get on your nerves because they're telling you the truth. And, and you know what the Bible says? He says, better are the wounds of a friend than the flattery of an enemy. So when you get somebody in your corner that will tell you, like my mother used to say, like a T.I. is, in season and out of season, and then they won't even let you retreat. When you retreat, they come and get you. I know you don't, I know you've seen my call. I know you see, and now then look, they, leave, they started leaving you them tight messages. I mean, you don't call, I'm going to call you two more times. Let you not answer. <laughs> he says, not forsaking. Some say not neglecting. I need you to know that we have an obligation for regular attendance at church. How is it that God chose the church to disciple the believers? You have an obligation for regular attendance. It's not just come when you feel like it. God gets the greatest glory when you don't feel like it and you come. Because you're not coming just for you. It's, there's some people here who look for you. You don't even know it. They're watching your every move. And, and they, they need you to be here. Some come just because you're going to hug them in the hallway. And guess what? You are the church. I need you, and you need me. And, and here's the thing. I, I even talked about this, and I'm going to move on. I need to lay this foundation for the caring church. I need you to understand that, no, you are not the church, and I am not the church, but we are the church. We are the church. So when you say to yourself, I can stay at home, I don't need no church, I don't need no building, well then why did God give the five-fold ministry for the equipping of the saints to do the work? You see, what we want to do, we want to come up with our own theology. We want to say whatever we want to say because it sounds good and everybody else is saying it, but that mess won't last. It won't stand the test of time. So what God begins to tell us, you have an obligation. You have an obligation. Church is not just a gathering, and if you've been gathering and you're not involved, then your potential has not been realized. You've just been attending, but you're not involved, and then you wonder why you feel like you're on the outside, because you are. Because you are. Yesterday, I called a couple of people. I could have called all of those people on that list, um, but I called a couple of people, and I called this one couple, uh, and I thought I would call another, and you know what they said? Listen, Fred and Carolyn right down the road, I can get them and come, and they can help us. And when they got together, you could see there was already a connection between them. Even the, They were fellowshipping even before I called. And one of the things you find out, many times you cannot have faith without fellowship. <laughs> your faith and your fellowship are connected. Notice that everything that Hebrews, Paul is talking and what Jesus is talking, it's about being there for somebody else. It's about being there. That's why he says, don't forsake it. He says, he says, provoke others to love 
and to good works. He said, don't forsake gathering when you're not here. When Alfred is not here, he can't get on Pop's nerves, and Pop's won't go get on Lonnie's nerves, and everybody's provoking one another. If they miss a service, one will call the other and say, what you doing? What happened? Did you what, did, you, did you sleep in? Because Alfred don't sleep. He, he like Jesus. <laughs> Alfred don't sleep. He don't slumber. <laughs> He's a watchman on the wall. Your faith and your fellowship are connected. And, and don't get messed up because you are an assembly of flawed people. That messes some of us up. You're in an assembly of flawed followers of Christ. Your pastor is flawed. Your first lady is flawed. I know she don't look like it. Y'all can see my flaw real easy. You don't see hers, but they're there. You're flawed. We're all flawed. Don't get messed up. And one of the things we saw last week is that what happened is you're so busy focusing on the flaws of the people, you're not focused on what God put in your hand. You got to focus on what God put in your hand because when you do that, you don't see all the flaws. You got too much work to do to be worried about flaws in other people. And if you're not using your gift to build up the church, you'll be tearing it down. So he says, it's not about you. It's about you exhorting others. It's about you urging others. It's about you encouraging others others. It's about you pushing others. It's about you provoking others. It's about you stirring up the gift. God has given you a, a gift to look in certain people's lives and see their flaws but give them grace. One of the things we find out is that many times it's hard to give people grace for the very thing we used to do. Why is that? Well, I'm I'm glad you asked. It's because many times we don't know it, but we hate ourselves for what we used to do. And when we see it in others, we end up having an attitude with them. You know, forgot you've been saved so long. You think because you see it that you've come some, so far, but your attitude says you haven't gone very far at all. Because by now you should be teaching, but you still acting like you are babe. You getting all messed up because the children are crying and laying in the floor. Come on, man of God. You expect children. My two-year-old grandson, he does the best he can with what he's got. And you know what? When we don't do what he says, he falls out in the floor. But he don't do it around his grandmother too quick because she's from the old school. She from the old school. And I'll be saying to her, do not be putting your hands on that boy. <laughs> she, <laughs> she don't always, but she got, she'd be like, mm, mm, mm. And after two or three hours, he got the, he got the sign. He fall out, she give him the look. I don't know where they go to get these looks. I think when the when the woman gets pregnant, she disappears and and they download all of it because and, and and they learn to even give the look to their husband because when I would say stuff, she'd be like, "You too." <laughs> I don't want to tangle with her. We need to understand that people are searching for a caring church. People, we all want to be in a caring community. But here's the problem. People want to be cared for, but they don't want to do the caring. You want somebody to care for you. You expect people to care for you. In fact, you get mad at the church when you're not cared for. But how, how in the world can you be in the house all this, long, all this time and you're still an attender, but you're not involved in anything? But you're mad because people don't know you missed three weeks. They don't know you. You're not involved. So when you're here, you're not involved. When you're not here, you're not involved. Well, what are they missing? And what we find, I, I really want to talk about the caring church.
church, but we cannot talk about it without the foundation of why we need the church. We need the church. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will stand forever. So what are you building your life upon? And man, if you're not building it upon this word, as soon as the storms come, it'll blow and the sand will erode. And before you know it, you'll be in the midst of what you're supposed to be standing over. Nobody gets in pass without a storm. Elder Ford was just saying that, how in the world, God? There are people all around you who are hurting. They're experiencing difficulty in their lives. They're spiritually searching for answers. And many of them are looking to you because they haven't learned to look to him. He's too far away. They haven't learned to hear the Holy Spirit. They only hear your spirit. They're looking for you to care about them, not just not just as soon as you meet them, you, you love them, but after three months, after six months, you own to the next person. You, you, you don't really have any staying power because love is what grounds us. Love is what keeps us. But many times we have an infatuation with people, and as soon as we see their flaws, we discard them. When they need us most. When they need you most. When they have fallen and they need somebody to seek some good in their, their messed up life. That's when you who are supposed to be rooted and grounded. That's why God put you here. You're not just here for you. You're here for them. for yourself we need people that will love us when we're most unlovable and it's not about a feeling it's about a commitment and, you, and what the problem is you have to know that you can't care for people when you don't even know how to care yourself see care for people does not originate in you. It originates with God. Huh? Care is originated with the Father. It is carried out by the Son. And then the people have to learn to love and care for one another. It originates with the Father. It's carried out by the Son. And people have to learn to love and care for one another. What do you mean it's originated with the Father, Pastor Campbell? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's my name, whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. And what I love about this um, God, watch this, he does not ask us to fit into his kingdom. How do I know? He makes the kingdom fit for us because while we were yet in sin, he died for us. He says, I didn't wait for you to get cleaned up enough to fit into this. I made this fit you. I made this fit you. Watch this, watch this. And so the love that we have been taught and caring that we have been taught, we don't know how to care for ourselves because we're using the way of the world as they, see the world says you better care for yourself. You know what that means? That means you better esteem yourself higher than anybody else. You better put yourself above everybody else. You better do for yourself first. And anybody that's in a love relationship know that's a disaster waiting to happen because until you put him first, until you put her first, until you stop waiting to get yours and give them theirs before you get yours, you're never going to have real love. Mm -hmm. I know that's tight, but it's right. 1 John 4 and 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we are to also love one another. 
But how can you love when, when you don't know how? How can you care for people when you think really caring for people is putting yourself first? Huh. Jesus was saying to them in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 through 40, he, he, he's saying to them, I need you to know that I'm going to judge you on how you love people and especially those who are not like you. He says, I'm going to judge you on how you love people, especially those who cannot do anything for you. Those I'm not, Anybody can love your supervisor. You don't really love him, but you, 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 you respect him. Anybody can love folks that are and care for folks that are caring for them, but he doesn't do that. He says, "Listen, in verse number uh, twenty, in verse number thirty-four, he says, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to come, and notice he says, when I come, I'm going to have the sheep and the goat together, and I'm going to look and, and look up. You can take that off for a second, and and the sheep and the goat." are together now. Look holy. You could be sitting beside an old goat. You know how you know the old goats? They always button everything. You know how the old goats? They got an attitude. They don't want to go along to get along. They feist there. They always got something to say about everything. There's something wrong with what everybody's doing, even though they are not doing. That's why they can see what's wrong with everybody else. Because you, when you're not doing anything, you can easily see what everybody else is doing. And what you take your gift that is supposed to build up the church, and you start tearing it down with your criticism. And, and the people around you, they know you're a goat. Some of you are old goats. Some of you are young goats. But they know you're a goat. You've got a goat attitude. After service, go, if you know somebody who got a goat attitude, don't put, don't put them out there. Say, you know pastor was talking about. And I'm here for you. I'm here to tell you what thus says the Lord. And he gave me a license today because... I'm here. There are so many people who don't care about you. They won't say anything to you. They just talk about you. But, but the, the Bible says, man, listen, if you got somebody that will tell you what you need to hear when you most don't want to hear it, you got somebody in your corner. Jesus is saying to them, when I come back, I know they're all going to be together, but I'm going to put the ones on the right hand that have been getting beyond themselves and going out to the homeless, going out to the naked, feeding those, giving water to the thirsty, See, being willing to, to love on that brother or that sister that's most like where you come from. And you don't recognize that God says, I don't want you to exalt yourself over them. He says, that's the way the world does it. He says, but I'm going to give you an example of how to care for people. He says, instead of exalting yourself, I want you to humble yourself. I want, in, Instead of de demanding your way, I want you to let them have their way. In, in fact, Jesus gives us an example in Philippians 2, 5, and 8. He says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, who has thought it not robbery to be equal with God, watch this, made himself of no reputation, emptied himself out, humbled himself even unto death, and that's when he showed that he cared for men. So if you're going to care for people, you're going to have to humble yourself, not exalt yourself. You're going to have to empty yourself of yourself. You cannot love people the way they need to be loved in your own strength. Let me say that again. You cannot love people the way they need to be loved in your strength. We want a caring church. A caring church is full of caring individuals. 
There is no way where many want to see a caring pastor, when many want to see a caring deacon, a caring elder, but you are called to be the church. When you connect with me and I connect with you and I use my gift and you use your gift, I can't even use my gift correctly without you. And what God wants us to understand, we've been conditioned to look for the clergy to care when God called you to care. Because there's some people that I will never know what they're really going through because they don't invite me to the house and they don't take me to Myrtle Beach when they're trying to get... W <laughs> so you, you've, seen, you've, seen, you've seen them pass out after, you know what I'm saying. You've seen, you, you've seen the kind of girls he likes and you know what kind of men she likes. She got bad taste. She can find the double time and no good, slew-footed. But you need to be there to say, come on, girl, let that thing go. Because Pastor Campbell is going to be the last one to find out about it. Christ said that the way you care, you have to empty yourself. And just because you are in attendance, you're not involved. And when you get involved, that involvement will stretch you. That's when you find out if you care. And sometimes you'll do it. And this, I don't get mad at people. You start out doing it for man, then you start to do it for Christ. Maybe you started because pastor asked you, really needed your help and needed your hand. But you got to do it because the joy of the Lord becomes your strength in the struggle. And, and, and you, you can only keep it up for a little while, but after a while you'll be gone because what made you come when doesn't have the power to keep you. And as soon as somebody get on your nerve and you haven't learned anything about grace and you haven't learned really anything about mercy, why? Because you've never been connected to anybody. Because as soon as you get connected to somebody that looked like they got it, Mike, Mike Wallace, you know, he don't talk very much from a distance. You wouldn't think he said anything to anybody. And this brother ain't never said a bad thing to nobody that I know of. But Dawn is not here today. <laughs> Dawn is first lady's armor bearer. Mike is one of my armor bearers. And, 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 but Dawn would have a different testimony. She sees him in a different light, shall we say. And because of that, she knows a part of him that I don't know and I don't believe. <laughs> Hallelujah. We need to learn to love people, learn to care for people. It must be learned and practiced. You, you don't get to practice it if all you do is come in and you don't talk to nobody and go right out the same way and then you say you don't feel like you're connected. Hmm. Yeah. And you got all these gifts and talents. A caring church is more than church with a care ministry. No, a caring church is when the individuals understand they have a role to play. A, a caring church is about relationship, but it's hard for us to go and have relationship with the homeless in the community and, and those who are naked in the community uh, uh, when we haven't learned to care for those who are in the church. And there are some folks who are in the church, but they feel homeless. Why? They feel like they're just on the outside. They, they feel like some, something's, something's missing. Something, you ever felt like something is missing? And you want to think it's missing because you're here on Sunday. But Sunday is a, a fulfillment of what you've been doing all week long, bruh. No, 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 come on, stay with me. You want to come in here and you want somebody to pray until you begin to, 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 to see the streets paved with gold. When you can hear the Holy Spirit whisper, oh man, I saw smoke in the room when he was praying. How you going to feel something when he praying and you hadn't felt anything all week? 
you you have you haven't even figured out how to quiet your spirit long enough to hear anything. But all of a sudden you want you 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 don't argue with everybody coming here. I'm talking about a caring church. I hope I'm on. Is this going out live? I think I need to edit it. <laughs> I might need to edit this. This may be. And there's something about learning to care that that you've got to be able to deal with people's brokenness and people's pain and not lose your mind. You, it really is a test. It's a test. It's a test. I had somebody send me a great uh, text the other day, and as I thought about it, uh, I realized that the trials have perfected me in some areas. The trials have strengthened me in some areas things that used to tear me down and break me apart and I'd be angry with people about this and angry and hold a grudge yes your pastor I shouldn't have said that it, I didn't hold it long though it was a short grudge very short minuscule but I found that in the course of those storms not only did people disappoint me but I found God disappointed some people too. You ever did anything that you couldn't believe you messed that up? I mean, you didn't plan to mess it up. You just, you didn't even see it the way they saw it in the end, and they had to help you to see it the way they saw it for you to see it. And you said, oh, I'm, I'm. but when you have been forgiven, you learn to forgive. But you're never even going to learn that if you're not connected or involved in anybody's life. A caring church must have relationship with the community, but it must first have relationship with the church. We cannot give people what we do not have. How are you going to go out there and love somebody homeless and you sit beside somebody homeless and you can't love them? You can't see it. And here's the thing that I know God wants us to do. He wants us to be able to understand that your ability to care doesn't come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Jackie, that's why you can come in and see some people. You don't know nothing about what they've been through, but you see them and your spirit is quickened. Just like that, you're like, oh, oh. My wife used to put people in headlocks. She'd be like, mm, the spirit be moving, and, and she'd run over and grab you and put you in a full Nelson. She, the Lord told me to tell you. <laughs> you know, she wouldn't do it quite like that. Right, Lex? But she would do it. I, I thought she, she told me she never played football, but she'd come flying know nothing and then people say how she know how she know he knows he knows and and there's a thing that God wants to do that he cannot do apart from brokenness and apart from the pain that people go through and we have to be able to love people in their pain they need you most in their pain they need you most in their problem and you're going to have to mature enough to love people when they're unlovable see the reason that we've been made to be overcomers so we can help somebody overcome the reason we're able to help the disadvantaged because we used to be one of them the reason that we can speak truth to power because there was somebody that had to do it for us and I need to be so in tune with the spirit of God that I don't even need to know what's going on. He'll tell me who I need to minister to. He'll tell me who I need to care for. Philippians 3 and 10 says we must know Jesus in the fellowship of his suffering before we can know him and the power of the resurrection. Suffering comes first, then power. A lot of us want power. 
We need to know that that person who is going through, who is broken down, God is just about ready to do something amazing in their life and he wants to use you and you're so busy judging them in the midst of their pain that you don't understand it's a portal. It's a portal to tell them about Jesus. God just gave you an entry point. You don't have to go over and beat them up. You go and lift them up. They know what they did wrong. You go lift them up. You don't tell them their bad was good. You tell them that God is good. God is able. God can turn it around. But you don't know I did this. I, I know, but God can do it. God can do it, baby. But you don't know I plan to do it. I know he know you plan to do it. But God can still turn it around for your good. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and allow the king of glory to come in. That's where you can praise him in the midst of your problem because he's the solution. Somebody shout Glory! about being a caring church and one person can't do it Jesus reached out to us through his suffering I love what Isaiah 53 and 5 I love it because it was through his suffering but he was pierced for our transgressions what he had to suffer to save us sometimes you're saving people and it causes you to have to suffer with them he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on his back, and by his stripes we were healed. Many of us don't want to go through with people when they're going through. Come on, man. Come on. You hadn't told your whole story. You know how we like to tell part of the story? Oh, I remember. <laughs> you want, and then God turned it around. You met, you skipped a whole bunch of stuff. Your trifling, you, you you skipped all the trifling stuff. You know, you tell a little bit of it. You don't tell all the trifling. You don't you don't tell everything. Yeah, I fell down once or twice in my life, but I got back up, and God did it. No, tell them about tell them about the whole thing. But we're always ready to go help the community. But love begins at home. And God is trying to get you. I can't see that sister. I can't see what she's going through. You need to love her. And many times, because of your relationship with her, you're the one that hurt her. It's hard to hurt people you don't know. It's hard to hurt people you don't hang out with. You don't even know she came because of you and you you looked like you were so high and you were doing so much. And, and then she went through some of the same things that maybe she didn't see you go through. And now all of a sudden, I can't, I ain't, I can't, I can't have nothing to do. Darkness can't have nothing to do with light. Well, you better be glad that ain't true because God got something to do with your dark self. Hakeem, this ain't coming out too good. Kadar, I don't know what's going on. This, an enemy has done this. I, I just don't want you to leave out of here without seeing you. Because guess what? I had to see myself. We got a minister carrying the church. We're ready to run to the community. You know how we can fake it? I wonder, don't answer. If you weren't an usher, would you speak to people? If you weren't on the door to be a greeter, would you say hi to anybody that you didn't personally know? If you didn't have to sing today, would you have come? Don't answer that because I know there are times y'all don't, you're not on the program, I look for you, you're not here. The scheme of the enemy has always been to divide and conquer. We have to care for the body. We have to learn to 
minister to the hurting in the church, we have to know that the Holy Spirit is what's going to lead us. And, and, and we have to understand care is created by community and it flows out of fellowship. Care is created by community and it flows out of fellowship. It, it, it's out of community. The people that care for you are the ones in your community. The reason I could call all those 30 or so people is because they're in my community. Y'all got a great compliment. Somebody said, Pastor Cam, a new beginning. Whenever you call or whenever we need y'all, y'all show up. You show up and we're willing to do everything. Because usually when we're doing it, we're doing it for the homeless. We're doing it for the helpless. We're doing it for the at risk. And if it had not been for the Lord, you see, we have to know that we've got to first, we've got to first care for our core and then the community. Isn't that what Jesus did? He spent time with the 12 of them, right? He didn't go out there. He walked past blind and lame. He was spending time with them. The Bible talks about uh, Jesus being in the same area where John was baptizing. Jesus, the Bible is real clear to say, but Jesus baptized none. His disciples did. He had given them the ministry. God is trying to give you the ministry of caring for the people in the church so you can then take that same love into the community. Now watch this. Many times we t we've been talking about loving people, talking about loving people, but when we were doing a great deal of talking, we were doing a least bit of loving. Because we would talk it here, but we couldn't walk it here. You would walk it with, you, you would, you would walk it with Valerie because you like Valerie. But you wouldn't walk it with Sean because you don't like Sean. You're not being led by the Spirit. You're being led by yourself. We all have to learn to be Spirit-led to care for the hurting. Not Pastor Campbell-led. You got to be God-led because he's going to tell you. And listen, young people too, sometimes God will, you'll be going to school and, and God will put that young girl on your mind. What do you think that's called the unctioning of the Holy Ghost? It's a quickening. It, 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 it kind of causes you to think. I was studying and, and preparing this message, and I realized it stepped on my toes because God had put two or three people on my mind. They've been on my mind for, you, you, you ever been like that? They just stay on your mind. They stay on your mind. And you don't, and you don't even know why. I, I mean, and, and I'm learning to answer that thing, but I realize that I miss it more than I get it right, and I'm determined to hear from the Holy Spirit because He wants me to care for the people, not because I'm the pastor, because I'm a person called by God, and He's going to use me. That's why He said over in Matthew 25, He says, "I need you to know." that when you did it to the least of them, you did it unto me. And you have to know, when you withhold yourself from fellowship in the church, you, you become like a stagnant well. There's no flow. You're enclosed. You're surrounded by yourself, by your own thoughts. And, and some of us like to say, well, I have good intentions, but intention without follow-up becomes a tool for deception. Your intentions without follow-up become a tool for deception, justifying your inactivity. Oh, you know you, you, know you can make an excuse. <clears throat> Anybody ever notice you can make an excuse for every job? You can make an excuse for every child, for every situation. Well, Rev, I would come, but you know, I, my kids, I got six of them, and, and they're doing something every day of the week. So Sunday, I got to rest. That's what the word say, don't it? 
Don't look at me. It's in the book. <laughs> but your intentions become an excuse, deception. It, it, it makes you hypocritical. You can't never do what God said, but you always got a reason why you couldn't. I need you to know he put so much emphasis on serving. Over in Hebrews chapter 10, Paul was saying, I want you to consider others. What? He said, yeah, I, I don't forsake gathering because I want you to consider who you are supposed to impact. Is your life your own or does it belong to him? Now, if it's your life, you do what you want. You don't have to listen. But I need you to know God always initiates the step. God is always the one that initiates the action. It is God that will speak it. You have to receive it. Just, just, just take about 10 seconds. I, I want you to, no, take 15 seconds. Over this last week, did God tell you to call anybody? Text anybody? Look, pray for anybody? Did he, is there somebody that's been coming to your mind and you just, you know, I'm going to get to it. I, you got good intentions. You may have prayed, but that ain't what he told you to do. He told you to call them. And do you know they, their, their life is hanging in the balance waiting on you to be obedient? And you wanna you wanna judge the pastor. Everybody wants the pastor. They want the they want the they want the clergy to do all the caring. And then you're so busy watching us that you can't even see you. So when you get sick, if Pastor Campbell, Elder Ford, Elder Jackie, <laughs> First Lady, if we didn't all call you. Even though you got calls from everybody else, you didn't know that I'm not the one that's supposed to keep you. I'm not in your circle. I'm not in your community in an intimate way. That same person that had the crab legs that you did not invite me to. The same one, the same one, the same one that you had the soul food Sunday and you ain't said ne'er word to me. <laughs> that one, <laughs> that, I mean, I'm not mad at you. Y'all know things change when the pastor come in to be like, oh, y'all be all turned up and he come in, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Phone start ringing. I'm in the driveway. Here he come. Here he come. Here he come. Girl, throw your cup away. Throw your cup away. <laughs> rinse it. Rinse it. Rinse it. Who got the mint? Who got the mint? Who got the? I need the mint. I need the mint. Praise the Lord, Pastor. How are you? Say, so I'm fine. Peppermint, peppermint snaps. And that, when they'll drink peppermint. Betty, you know. <laughs> it seemed like there was a drink, Mr. Hooper. Was there a drink, peppermint snaps? Ah! <laughs> I need you to know that people need us to be caring. When they least deserve it, man, they need us. They need us to not be so judgmental. They need us to give them the same grace God gave you. They need you to stop making excuses and do what thus says the Lord. Sometimes God will give you a word that it's a correction, a word of correction. And, and, and that's never easy to deliver. But when you do it, wrapped in love, and genuinely because you care, man, it makes all the difference. So many people, I, go ahead, Zay, I'm going to wrap up, and it'll help me if you start playing. I know it's time to go. 
yesterday, not yesterday, the day before, Friday, we were over at Houston Moor, and we were feeding the people. And uh, I was in contact with all, not, I was in contact with several churches around our city that were doing the same thing. Three of us churches were over here, and some were on the other side of town. But what dawned on me, there are people who doesn't, who don't even say or espouse caring for the community. They'd much rather go to Zimbabwe or some other place, and that's their mission field. But I was just a little bothered by those who say they love this community, but ain't never in it. I saw the same folks. And, 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 and if, so you don't get it twisted. I, I saw churches that are 99.9% .9 white who don't say they're in the community, but they stay in it. Every time I turn around, I need something. I can call them, and they can. I can get it. And I saw other churches, not big churches, some big, but small churches, 20, 30 people. Pastor Jameson, I mean, he's out there. He got maybe 30 people on a good Sunday. But once a month, he's in the community doing. But at least he knows that's what God has called him to do. And, and New Beginning, y'all need to know that it, it, the mission field for us is Wilmington. That's why when we need to go to the school board to talk about the redistricting, I need you to show up for others that won't come. Some of you all, I will give you, I will write out the speech, but you got to say it. Why? Because you're, you're Asian or you're Hispanic or, 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 or you're, you're a woman or you're a man. But we've got to care. People say, Pastor Kevin, why are you? I've been in this community since I got here for the school and my kids, I, I didn't have to go to my kids' school. I had to go to other people's kids' school because we have to care. But stop sitting at home talking about Pastor Campbell's on TV. Ha, ha, ha. Get. Come and go with me. Come, come and go with me. Y'all stand to your feet.